Thanks for joining us on Northwest Access TV. I am Paul Snyder, Programming Coordinator here. Uh, today we want to talk about a very serious matter um, and something that your local police are, are doing to keep you safe. I have with me Lieutenant Ron Hogue from the St. Albans Police Department. Thanks for joining us today. Sure, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, uh, about a month ago I had seen, uh, well actually our studio was shut down because mm -hmm. um, your department had taken over the school uh, during one of the spring, I think it was spring break, right. to do some tactical training exercises. Right. So I reached out to you and I said, well, do you mind if one of our photographers follows you around? Because I'd love to be able to talk about some of the things you guys do. Right, yeah, it was great. Yeah, so I guess I'll get into it, is what what did those three days consist of? Okay, so, so basically um, in response to all of the active shooter situations that have gone on throughout the country, um, we as a police department take it very seriously that we have to be prepared to respond to something like that. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to do that, um, but in these days and times with um, the global situation that it is, um, and then domestic terrorism, even that, uh, and also, you know, just um, mentally deranged individuals, uh, we have to prepare um, to be able to respond to those types of incidents. Um, so as a department, we've really put a priority on being prepared for those things. Um, we have done uh, not only training with our officers, but we've done training with the, with the public uh, and different uh, organizations, the school, uh, the city hall here in St. Albans. Uh, we've trained their employees on how to respond if there is an active shooter or someone um, who intends to do harm. Um, we've done several other businesses also. Um, and part of what, we're, what we've done also to respond to that is we have now formed a joint effort with the Sheriff's Office, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office, um, as a uh, joint tactical team. Um, so over the past year and a half, we've been training with their officers and our officers together um, and have uh, trained up to the point where uh, we are a nearly fully capable uh, SWAT team or, or uh, tactical team. Um, so what we decided as a team is that we can, we can respond to those types of situations. However, the philosophy in police work uh, in, and with us uh, is that an active shooter situation is a patrol responsibility. It is going to be the actual officer in a uniform, in a black and white car in our case, or a red and white car uh, in the sheriff's office case, um, who's going to respond to an active shooter and who is going to be the person that's going to solve that. It's not going to be a tactically, you know, a tactical team or a or a tactically trained officer um, who is going to respond from his house or off duty um, or even our office uh, to be able to to take care of that. That is going to be handled by someone who is out on patrol every day. So what we need to do as a department and as a team is prepare our patrol officers to be able to handle that type of situation. Right, you're, you're, you're preparing everybody. Exactly, we're not just training you know, a certain amount of people in the department to be able to respond to this. We train all of our officers in this type of, in this type of response um, because the philosophy years ago uh, used to be in, in, in the law enforcement world when I started back in 91 and up until Columbine in 1998 uh, was that uh, we were going to uh, surround the building if there was a situation like this. We would simply surround the building as patrol because we weren't equipped or trained to be able to handle that type of situation. Mm -hmm. And at Columbine, the lessons that we learned was uh, by surrounding the building uh, and uh, waiting for SWAT to show up to handle the situation, while we're doing that, people are, people are getting hurt and dying on the inside of the building when there's a shooter. So the philosophy then changed to get into the building as quickly as possible and stop that shooter. Um, there was an iteration there for a few, few years that went through uh, where we would wait for, two, for up to four officers to get together before we made an entry into the building to get to where that person was doing harm. That's now even changed. Uh, we are training officers now that if you're the first officer on the scene, you're to go to wherever that, that individual is at and mm. causing the harm you're to get there as quickly as possible and engage that shooter. Um, and what I, what I, when I train other officers to do this type of response and when they go through the training at the academy, basically it's told to them that, you know, this is what you get paid for. We would rather, as the police, we would rather have that individual shooting at us than shooting at innocent citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a responsibility that we take very, very seriously. Um, we would rather do that. 
Um, we have the equipment to train to, to do that. We have the training and what we're doing in these three days, what we were doing was we were training our officers um, to live up to that standard and be able to respond to those types of situations. So specifically these, these training days that we were doing, uh, we were actually sharing as a, as a tactical unit, we were sharing our techniques for responding you know, to these types of situations with the normal patrol officer. So all of our police officers at the St. Albans Police Department went through the training uh, so that they're, they're more prepared. So that's now, essentially. Through these, these training courses, and you've done them for, for years, I believe, what you were telling me, um, have you, and I don't know if you can tell me or not, have you come into a situation where some of these training exercises have been real life experiences as well? Or have um, we been, I, I guess, for lack of a better word, lucky enough that we haven't had to see Well, in, in my career, I have, I've been lucky enough where I haven't had to respond to any type of active shooter situation or anything like that. Um, I will say that, that a lot of the techniques that these guys learned in those three days are also applied to something as simple as a normal building search at mm -hmm. night when they get called to a building that, where there's an alarm and there's an open door. Um, they can apply some of these training techniques to be safer searching that building and using help Clear, you know, clearing doorways and that type of thing um, in a more effective manner so that they're, they're not in quite as much danger as they would be. Um, so they can use these in other situations. I, you know, I can think of a few situations in my career and even here in St. Albans where, you know, unfortunately we've had to point guns at people to, to get them to comply to what we wanted them to do. Um, but fortunately we haven't had someone um, who's actively, you know, engaging in killing somebody. Um, at a at a business, um, of course, we did have someone doing that exact thing. You know, what is it? Three years ago now, with uh, the shooting that we had on North Main Street, right? Um, that would have been really considered an active shooter. Um, if that had continued, where he was, you know, going to take actions on other people other than just that poor poor victim that he did, um, you know, that would have that would have evolved into something more than that. But that at that point when that was going on, that was considered an active shooter. And the officers who responded to that handled it appropriately by getting to him and making sure that he didn't engage anyone else. Right. You know, luckily he didn't have that intent. Gotcha. So. Um, I, I, this is probably a very obvious question, but I'll ask it anyway. Can you go into the into details about the importance of going through the training? Sure. The, 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 like a, you know, like I was just saying, the uh, you know the philosophy behind active shooter response has changed a lot over the years. Um, so the officers that some of the officers that we have, we've had a, we've had some changeover in the last five years of of lesser, you know, our younger officers I should say who have gone through the academy, and at the academy they learn the basics of building clearing and room clearing and and uh, that type of thing, and they do get some training in active shooter response and what their responsibility would be. What we want to do as a department is specifically give them what we are going to do as a department um, and learn how other officers are going to respond. If one of our tactical officers shows up, they're trained to a certain level and to do things a certain way. And what we wanted to do was pass that on to our normal patrol officers mm. um, to be able to, so that they're prepared to, to help, you know, or, or to be safer uh, in what they were doing. So this training was very important for them to go through. Um, and we do it, you know, we do this type of training probably every other year um, to bring people up to speed and keep them fresh. Um, so I, I wish we could do it more than that. I wish we could do, I wish we could do it, you know, four or five times a year, but right. unfortunately schedules and budgets don't allow that. But, um, you know, we, uh, we do it as frequently as we can. The other thing that we did during this training was, is we passed along a lot of the prior preparation that the administration of the police department has done with, uh, letting the, the normal patrol officer know what we're training the citizens to do. Um, you know that as a department we've we've subscribed to the philosophy of run hide fight which is a uh, DHS or Department of Homeland Security um, initiative um, to train citizens in how to respond if they're ever inside an active shooter situation uh, and it basically gives them options to either run away if you have the chance um, or hide if if you can't run away or even if it's a last resort to fight against the person who's going to try to harm you so what we wanted to do was, is we wanted to make sure that our officers knew what citizens were being trained to do. Uh, and also, you know, that the, that the department has made a lot of prior preparations as to who's going to respond to what, who's going to be in charge of medical care, 
who's going to be in charge of blocking roads, who's going to be in charge of afterwards, you know, getting, if it's at a school, for instance, um, getting those kids back to their parents. Mm -hmm. um, all of that has been thought of prior to now. And we don't want to be caught at the point where something happens and we don't have, right. um, you know, we don't have a plan. Um, and our, you know, we've done a lot of, a lot of, a lot of prior preparation to this. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to pass that on to our normal officers so that they know when you respond, this is what's going to be going on behind the scenes. So right, you don't want anybody out of the loop. Yeah, we don't want anyone out of the loop. Right. We want them to know that you know there's there's a lot of thought that's gone into this as a as an administration and as a police department and as a city and town as a whole. Um, so we want you to be aware of what's been going on. So that was that was part of what they went through that day was it was an orientation session in the morning uh, where we went through all of the policy that we've done and all of the preparations that we've done so that they know you know who has keys. Um, you know, our, we've made preparations for us to have keys to get into buildings. Okay. You know, if a building goes into lockdown, right. um, we either have to have a key to get in or we have to break something to get in. Um, so we wanted the officers to be trained um, to use a, uh, uh, you know, a crowbar or, mm -hmm. you know, what, what we call them is a, you know, an entry tool um, to be able to break glass or to break the door to be able to get in. Um, you know, we wanted them to know that those tools are there for them. Um, and that we do have keys to get into buildings, that we do have uh, things that have been done um, so that we can, we can you know, make their job easier. Yeah. So do you mind if we watch a little bit of the video and no, you kind of just give us a, a summary of what's going on sure. at the time? There are three clips here. So sure, absolutely. Start with the first one absolutely. So, so what's going on here is, um, this is Officer Tim Adams. He's, he's actually entering this room by himself um, there's an individual on the floor here that I believe he's already enga had to engage. It, I would I believe that this subject is a uh, is a bad a bad guy. We you know a suspect, mm -hmm. um, and he's had to engage him, and that's why he's down on the ground there. You can see the firearms that he's you know that he's dropped. Um, this on this day we were actually training with uh, airsoft guns um, that fire uh, you know little small plastic right. pellets. Um, and in in our experience, there's nothing like having. Um, you know, you can shoot paper targets on a range. Um, you can go through scenarios where, and it, it, could you pause it, right, pause it right there for sure. just a second and I can explain something about that. So, and it relates to what I'm saying is, is uh, you know, shooting at stationary paper targets is one thing, but when there's an actual individual who has got the capability of shooting back at you, right. you tend to slow down your tactics. And what Officer Adams is doing there is he's making an entry into that room by himself and he's trying to clear around that corner by seeing you know, where other threats are. He's already seen one threat and he's trying to make sure there aren't any other ones. So he's really slowed down his tactics, which is what we want them to do at that point, um, to be safe. Um, and by using you know, force on, what we call force on force, uh, where somebody actually has something shooting back at you, it's much more valuable training to do that. Right. So but that's what he's doing there. And I think one thing I remember seeing was um, in some of the other videos is talking about um, your line of sight and making sure that you have a lot of line of sight. Correct. And then being able to scan the room that way. That's actually, yeah, it exactly. It looks like that's what he's doing now where yep. he can see in front of him, yep. but he's peeking around a corner in a way that he can see most of the room until, and then as you see closer on. Then as he gets there, then he, he enters sees, quickly. Right, he sees that target to the, yep. to the left he's taking. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing there, is he's trying to be as safe as he possibly can, keep himself in a position of advantage um, where he can use cover um, until the point where um, he can't use cover anymore and he comes out and he saw that target around the corner, yeah. Right. So here's so. another one here, and this is yep. like you were saying, an active person. Yep. And I think they're, they're following him now. Yep, so what they've got here is, you know, they know that they've been called um, to a person who, who's actually been shooting. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to test their ability to not only apply force, but to not apply force. Um, and in that situation there, the subject, as you see before that, he, didn't he wasn't displaying a weapon. Right. So what we were trying to train them is, if you're going into a school or any kind of building, you know, the subject is dressed a certain way, but you can't be sure that that is your suspect. That could be, that could be you folks or whoever, right. who are dressed in a coat and a, and a hoodie that day. And we want to make sure that our officers are trained to apply force correctly, also, and not just not just indiscriminately, you know, shoot whoever they feel. So they were doing what they needed to do there, where um, 
they didn't engage him until he ran into that room, retrieved a firearm, and then came back out. Right. And that's where we are. And that here. was part of that scenario, and that's where they're at right there, yeah. So the officers were engaging him after he fired at them. And these folks down here are, are the instructors who right, are kind of watching. Right, behind, following right. behind. Right, right. So now these folks are, they're, they're kind of working together because now what they've got is, this is a tough situation because they've got a suspect who's already gone into this room over here. But then they've got an open door on the right side here, which is, opens up, if I remember right, to a large, large room. Right. So they're at a real disadvantage because if there's a sec if there's a second suspect in that room, they've now put their backs to him, um, but they have to make a choice because there's only two. Um, and remember, I said these guys understand that they're putting their lives in danger so that citizens won't have to be in danger. So they're going to go into this room where this subject went to, um, to to engage him because he's now the primary threat that they have. And it looks like they both they both did take a look over their uh, they did. their left shoulder into the room where they could see a line of sight first yep. before deciding to yep. go right. That's as well. absolutely correct. They they did they they uh, they looked in there and just cleared it really quick. But their primary threat they know that the subject who just shot at them it's has going in this the other room. Way. Correct. Yeah. And remember, there, there, there's also there's audio that's if you could hear the audio that's going on at this point. I believe the scenario, there were people in this room that this suspect was now threatening. Right, I think, I think once he was in there, there's like some screaming or something going on Correct. in the background as well. How does right. that play into it? Because, I mean, that just gives you a bet, uh, like a more of a real life scenario, right? Right, and yeah, right. And what, what we did with this scenario was we actually added noise to the situation because there's gonna be a lot of different sure. stimulus, if you, if, you want, if you will, going on there. I mean, there's gonna be noise and possibly smoke in the room. There may be, you know, Maybe the person has set off smoke devices or maybe has even planted IEDs. I mean, we don't know. Um, so if there had been something like that, I mean, we have to, we're trying to make the officers think about all of these different things going on at once and prepare them for, and get their stress level up high because we want them to be able to handle that stress level at a real, at a real incident, so, yeah. So they're now heading into this room. Yep. I believe they're kicking away yep. his weapon as well. Yep, yep, I believe they engaged him in that room there and uh, they're taking his weapon away. And these folks that were, the folks that were the role players for us uh, were a mixture of sheriff's office employees um, or deputies who, uh, who were uh, on the team, were on our tactical team, um, and also uh, other volunteers that we used. Uh, we even used a couple of students that, were, that, that attend BFA oh, okay. um, as, uh, as volunteers to play you know, role players. Do you so. think that that would have a lasting effect on them as well, these students? If, I mean, God forbid something actually happens, but maybe they have a knowledge of what's going on? Yeah, I, th I think you're right. That's a good point in, in that. I think they, they do get some value out of that um, because, you know, they've already been through that situation and they see how we're going to respond. So, yeah, it, it does. It does give them a little bit of uh, a value in that. And if I remember correctly, the, 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 indiv the persons we were using as uh, role players are also our police explorers. So they're young people, but they're, they're kind of exposed to the police environment mm. and that type of thing. So they're familiar with us a little bit. But, gotcha, yeah. okay. And then it has, as they said, they scan in. Right. And they head in. And then this last one here, I believe involves our photographer with another person as well, <clears throat> and then the shooter in the room. Right, yeah, and I was, <laughs> I was actually part of this uh, this scenario as a uh, as a hostage. Oh, there are three people there. There okay. are three people there. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, what we were doing was uh, we were we wanted this scenario to be where the officers came into the room um, and saw this individual here, who's a, who's a, who's the suspect, holding three hostages. And uh, I think actually I think we uh, yeah we had three folks that were sitting there. One was our explorer. One was myself sitting in the middle. And then I believe that's your cameraman. Yep, that that's we our were, camera yeah, guy, Zach. Actually, yep. He was a good guy. He actually uh, he actually volunteered to help us. So um, this is a high stress situation for any police officer coming into, and you can see him coming in the door there. This is a really high stress situation where um, you know they've got a responsibility to try to engage this subject as quickly as possible to make sure that he doesn't harm the the, the hostages. So this is a tough tough situation for any police officer to get into. Um, probably one of the highest stress ones that, that we could think of. Um, so by putting them through this, we're hoping that they, they learned a lot about what stress level is and how they can respond to that for real. Okay. Now, in this situation that we're about to see is the officer engages with the gunman here. Yep. 
and then he doesn't take force until he shoots his weapon. Right. So can you get? Can you just go a little detail into, into sure. why sure. he wouldn't? If sure. he can see the gun, would he normally? Sure. Sure. So he says a no, and then you get here he shoots, and yeah. then he's engaged. So, so what we're trying to do there is, you're absolutely right. The officer in this case uh, was a little slow in implying force. Um, if he's got three hostages who are sitting there, he's got the gun in his hand. Um, at that point, he is putting those three people in danger. Mm -hmm. um, according to our use of force policy and accepted policies around the country, we can actually apply deadly force at that point because he, th those folks are in imminent danger. And I certainly hope that anyone watching would, would certainly understand that um, we, we shouldn't be waiting for somebody to get hurt before we try to hurt, help them. Um, so in that case, the officer, we wanted him to engage that person prior to him firing. But that's the point of this as well. This is the training. You're, exactly he's now right. been through this this scenario before exactly. because of the training that you guys are putting together. So exactly. now if this ever does become a real life scenario, he's exactly. ready for it. He knows exactly. what he needs to do. And that's that's, that's the point of it. That's exactly this. right. You know, and after the scenario was over, we went we we went a debrief with these two officers that came in and you know went through what was going through their head when they came through the door. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Um, and, and you're absolutely right. Now that they've been through that, they can learn from that and they can make their mistakes in a in a classroom instead of having it in a real situation so that the next time um you know they will be able to you know apply it correctly sure you know and i think so. that's it so he um the one thing that i remember seeing is any time that any of your officers ever did shoot again with the airsoft gun right um you know you hear from the the suspect at the time like got it and then they go down so right. just to know that Right. Um, you know, okay, we're good. I'm going down now. Right. And then again, they come in. This guy here, he did exactly what the first guy did, yep. just peeking around the corner. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Yep, exactly. And, and our suspect here was, was uh, you know, he was told prior to this that um, if they didn't immediately engage him when they came in the room, um, that he was to shoot. And that would prompt them, you know, to shoot right. uh, him. Um, and, and, and it's a natural thing for the officers to come in and try to negotiate a little bit with the person to try to get them to give up peaceful, peacefully first. Um, and that may be appropriate, um, but it, it, you know, in some situations, but in this situation here, as soon as you saw, as they saw the gun uh, and him holding hostages, they, they were legally justified to apply um, force at that point, like lethal force. So uh, we've seen some of the video, you've been able to break it down. I really appreciate yep. you being able to yep. do that. Sure. Um, we've talked about the difference in philosophy over the years. Yep. You said you've been doing this for, for I think, more than 20 years. Yeah, I'm in my 25th year. So w your first time ever doing something like active shooter training, mm -hmm. what's, what's been some of the differences in, in how you guys approach doing it then sure. and then doing it now? So I, I want to say the first Active shooter training that I went to in my career was in like 1999, late 99, 2000, somewhere around there, and that was after Columbine. And really, that was the first time that American police had to really deal with something like that. We had had ones in the past um, where, and if you think way back in the 60s, the, the Austin Tower, in, in, or the, the school tower in Austin, where there was a guy with a rifle who was engaging citizens. That's an active shooter. Um, back then they just kind of handled things the way they handled them and they didn't have a way of um, you know getting that train or getting better training out to the people or the, the officers um, so when I went through that in 2000 you know we were trained um, to get into the school but you were gonna wait for three other officers to join you mm -hmm. so that you could be safe getting into there and then engaging the suspect with four officers versus one or right. two I subjects. would assume it's a, it's a game of numbers, right? It is. It always comes down to a game of numbers where we, we want, as the police, we want to have our, our the advantage be to us, obviously. Um, we're trying to swing those odds to our side. The shooter is always going to have an advantage because they know where they're at. They know what they've done. They have a prior knowledge of, of where, they're, where they're going to go, mm -hmm. um, things they're going to do. Um, and, and what we try to train not only our police officers but citizens when we do the training for run, hide, fight is one of the things I try to impress on them is that this is a, this is a counting clock. Um, the suspect knows that as soon as they shoot their first person or harm their first person, 
um, the clock has now started for when the police are going to arrive mm -hmm. and they're, they're going to be engaged by the police. So the faster that we can get that notification to the police and the faster that or the more that we can delay the person from harming someone else, um, the better off we are. So all of the preparations that schools take and other buildings, you know, public buildings take about securing doors, uh, making an alerting system, um, working on hiding and, and doing the whole run, hide, fight, um, you know, system, that's all to delay that person um, from harming people until the police can get there and engage that person. Um, so the faster that we can get there and the quicker that we're notified, the better off we are. So. When I say getting there, I mean the actual officer getting to where that subject is. So once the officer arrives, the officer has to identify where that subject now is. So that person, the person who's doing the harm, has that advantage from the beginning. They know exactly right. where they're going to be. The officer has to now locate them. So if we have to sit outside and wait for four officers to get together and then go into that building um, to find that person, I understand the thinking that was back then was... Well, let me say this, we have, we have what's called, our, our tactical team runs under what's called a priority of life. And our normal priorities are the, uh, the suspect is, the, is at the bottom. Um, innocent citizens, hostages um, are first, and then police officers. Um, our lives come after theirs do, mm -hmm. and then suspects after us. In this type of situation, um, we're, still, we're still functioning under that, under that premise um, where the officer, the officer will, will put himself second before the citizens do. So um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get that officer there as quickly as possible. So back in the original training that we did by waiting for four officers to get together, how long is it going to take, you know, four officers to get together? Right, to a certain location. Especially sure. in a rural area. I mean, if we're talking about some of the schools that are up in the eastern part of this county, I mean, there may be one officer who's working that area. Mm -hmm. Is he going to wait, you know, 20 minutes for an officer to respond from St. Albans or, you know, from the next town over to come and help him. The way we're training now is no, that officer is actually going to go into that building and he's going to engage that shooter. And while that person is shooting at the police, he's not shooting at citizens. So that's why we're, you know, that's the difference in the training that we're doing now is we want to get one or two officers there as quickly as possible versus waiting for three or four. And those are some of the things that have changed over time as far as a philosophy. Um, obviously, we've had, you know, we've had better ways of clearing, clearing rooms and you know, better equipment in shooting and better, you know, better ways of, of training our officers. I mean, we didn't have airsoft guns 25 years ago. Right. There was nothing like that we could train with. So you know, those types of things have come along that have allowed us to, to train better um, and to uh, you know, and prepare our police officers a lot better, so. We, we've talked about what it used to be like, what it is now. Where do you, any idea where do you think this is, where new tactical training exercises are headed? Um, I think you're going to see, it's, and it's, this is unfortunate, I think in the next 10 years you will probably see where, as we had to do with stop, drop, and roll, mm -hmm. you know, back in the 70s with, when we were kids learning how to, learning how to prevent fire, you know, being burned in a fire and that kind of thing. I think you're going to see every citizen is going to be trained in run, hide, fight, um, or at least a system in order to prevent themselves from being shot or being harmed in an active shooter. Like I said, it's a, it's a very unfortunate thing that we have to prepare for those types of incidents. Um, but as we've seen, I mean, there's there's almost one every day here in the United States uh, where where there's a subject who is who is doing harm to others. Um, so I think you're going to see that part. Um, be increased as far as citizens being trained. As far as tactical use, I, I think you're going to see a more of a proliferation of, um, of regular police officers who will have more uh, training or more of this type of thing. I know other departments are also doing this type of training with their officers where the actual you know, officer on the beat has more equipment and more ability to be able to handle these types of situations. So I, I think you're going to see that. Um, I would love to have if someone could come up with some type of some type of way where we could prevent the whole thing, where we could identify individuals who are going to do this thing and we could mm -hmm. arrest them ahead of time, that'd be fantastic. Right. Um, so we could prevent the whole thing. But until we come up with that, then we have to be prepared for what happens in the aftermath. We talked so. about um, just a couple of the students that uh, were involved and they, uh, you know, talking about how much they benefit from it. Have you guys 
thought about doing presentations, and maybe you already do at schools. We do. To, um, it, can you go into detail about mm -hmm. what presentations you guys do for the students, so to let them know sure. that what you guys are doing when if it's something like this were to happen? Well, all of the all of the all of the kids receive training from the school as far as what to do in an active shooter situation or a uh, lockdown situation. Or a lockdown right. situation, yeah, and and they're mandated by state law to to do so many training drills per year, so they get. They get most of that training from, from the school staff. Um, obviously, we have a school resource officer here at BFA, and we have one at, at, at the town school. Um, and they're, you know, they're there as, as resources, but so far, the police haven't done a lot of the training with the students, and I'm, and I'm not sure why that is. I mean, there's a various reasons why that could be. I think that they receive it well from, from the teachers and from the staff at the schools, and they've been doing a very good job with it. Um, but you know the, the kids are aware of it it's unfortunate that they have to think about those types of things when you're in school and um, but you know they, they 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 have been they have been receiving training on what to do and those types of things right I know when I was in school the biggest thing was fire drill yeah and that was it right. and not until um, even past high school for myself we did you didn't have lockdown drills right. you didn't have those types of things. it was the fire drill and that was it um, so it's just a different culture we're in now that this is, like you said, it's becoming almost a regular thing that right. you have to prepare kids for something that like like when we were kids, it was just a fire drill. Now right. it's other things that are coming to play. Yeah, there's so many other things that the kids have to worry about these days right. uh, that we never had to. Um, but, uh, but you know, we as a society, you know, I think we've done a fair job of responding to those things. There's always a catch up period. Um, I think kids are better trained today than they ever have been or you know know more about um, the world than we ever did. Um, so you know I think there's more they're more prepared that's 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 for certain. Well, Lieutenant, I really want to thank you for stopping by and going over some of these things oh. and hope this video will help other people learn like what you guys are doing and certainly um, and how to stay safe in a situation as well and to know that you guys are taking the precautions ahead of time to help keep everybody safe. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, if, if uh, there are other people in the community that, that want more information about, about training their employees or, you know, anything like that, I mean, I'd be glad to, to, to help them with that. Do you, would you guys set something up like that? If you had a, say, um, I don't know if they do an area, but say like the hospital came mm -hmm. out to you and said, you know, we'd like to do a training yep. or something, that's something you guys would be able yeah, to do? Yeah, absolutely. We've done, it for, we've done it for a couple of private businesses here in town. We've done it for um, the, state, the state building that's here in St. Albans. We've done training for them. Um, we're working on doing drills with them. Um, we've even had it here at school. We've even had an active drill where we actually put a police officer in the school acting as a, an active shooter oh, wow. and train the, the teachers um, to do, you know, to, to, to act on that and how to lock down and those types of things. We haven't done it with the kids present um, and that's something we haven't crossed and I'm not sure how to approach that and, or what the value with that would be. Uh, I don't know if I would want to put the kids through that type of thing, um, but, uh, but we have done it with other private businesses um, and the state building, like I said, so yeah, we've, we've are more than glad to come in and do training for their employees or um, do a drill with them, anything like that. Okay. So, yeah. so again, if you're a business that wants to, again, take those precautions and learn how to be safe yep. in this type of situation, you can give the police department a call. Yeah, they can contact me at the police department and we'll, uh, we'll work on that with them. Great. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming in today. We Thanks. really appreciate it.